You welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. It came as a cherry news for many when recently the United States government approved the sale of close to one billion dollars worth of military hardware to Nigeria to assist in an ongoing war against terrorists operating around the northern flanks of the country. A few days later, it became a bittersweet experience when news broke that another aircraft belonging to the Nigerian Air Force had crashed somewhere around the city of Kaduna killing the two hair personnel on board. This latest mishap seems to encapsulate how much sacrifice Nigerian troops have committed to winning the war on terror, albeit against mounting odds. Many aviation watchers have the view that much of the damage has been as a result of inconsistency in operations and logistic, logistical planning. Or that say there's an urgent need to take a hard look at the planes in the disposal of the Air Force with a view to isolating the hair-worthy ones from those which are now mere scrap iron. Well, joining us now to have a chat are Isaac Balami, who is the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Seven Stars Global Hangars and the former President of Aircraft Engineers Association of Nigeria, together with retired Air Commodore Abayo Mibalogun, a former fighter pilot and Liberian War veteran, who in his service days logged in more than 2,500 hours, about 600 of them combat hours. Good morning, gentlemen. You're welcome to the program. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning, Pleasure. Mr. Balogun. Good morning. All right, let me start. Uh, Good well, morning, I mean, Steve and thank, Abby. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Well, you know, I mean, this is um, an important subject. Uh, in about a year, about four crashes involving uh, military uh, aircraft. Um, should this get us worried? Are we okay uh, with the sort of investigations, etc., uh, you know, that have been carried out? You know, given what has happened again on Tuesday, how will you look at um, the state of the aircraft that our Air Force is using vis-a-vis uh, -vis our readiness and our seriousness about this war against bandits? I think, Mr. Balogo, you can uh, go first, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, at this stage, yeah, you talk about other past accidents, but this particular one is not enough to judge the combat readiness of the Air Force. Number one is a trainer aircraft, and they were operating in a training institution where you must train to prepare for eventualities. And uh, accidents do happen. It's unfortunate that uh, it's sounding strange to a lot of people, but we in the industry who have flown and seen a lot of things. It is expected, except you don't fly. When you fly, there will be accidents. Now we fly more than ever. The Air Force is flying so much sorties all over Nigeria. Like when you drive on the road, especially during festive season, you have more accidents on the road. So when you fly more, you have more accidents. It's sad, but then that's the reality of life. And uh, if you compare the accident rate in Nigeria to other air forces, even the most advanced air forces, we are still not doing badly. But if we isolate it and say, yes, two people died last week, Another two people died two days ago. No. Uh, for me, it's not a reason. This particular accident, we are not there yet until the investigation is concluded and we know. Was it a pilot error, a machine error, or an act of God? <clears throat> then we can now go down and say, this is the cause, and let's address it. For now, everybody is guessing. All right. So, uh, Mr. Balami, let's, let's come to you. Could you talk us through the maintenance culture within the Nigerian Air Force uh, in terms of what are, how strict mm -hmm. are the terms for, you know, maintenance, the depot maintenance, as well as serviceability? In the past, this has been li linked to lack of funding. Is this still an issue? How strict is the maintenance culture? Uh, thank you very much, Abby, uh, for this uh, question. May I start by, you know, um, you know, uh, saying very, very sorry to all Nigerians and the families of those who lost their loved ones 
uh, whenever a plane crash happens, directly or indirectly, we're all affected. And this is the sad news, and uh, we pray that uh, God will comfort the family. Um, when you talk about maintenance, <clears throat> I'm not an Air Force personnel. I'm actually into the civil aviation. But in the last 15 years, I've had the privilege to actually, you know, interface with the Air Force, uh, even when I was uh, national president for aircraft pilot and engineers for about eight years. And uh, currently, we operate from Lagos 205 Rotary Wing Hangar, where I work closely with the Air Force. And um, I can assure you that uh, the Air Force of those days is not what applies now. There's serious improvement. I'm fully, fully aware that as at last year, on a quarterly basis, the current chief of air staff, who is a foreign certified trained safety officer with decades of experience in the Air Force and also around the world, has ensured that all pilots undergo recurrent training all over. And that has been happening in badges. I have that information. I'm also fully aware that the audit is also being carried out quarterly across every unit of the Air Force. I am also currently, you know, working on some platforms with the Air Force. And uh, I know how the Air Force come to audit us as one of the biggest aircraft maintenance facility here in West Africa, Seven Star Global. And I know their requirements. Things have actually changed. But you see, let me just tell you this. Just to you know, take away fears you know, from the flying public. The United States of America alone from 2013 to 2018, in five years, have had about 186 plane crashes in the Air Force alone, killing about 222 crew, whether be it pilots, technical crew, and what have you, and mechanics. And uh, all those people, you know, that is an average of about 40 people were dying in the Air Force in the U.S. every year. Sorry, about 40 aircraft and about 45 uh, people died, personnel. Uh, if you look at the population of the U.S. and look at the Nigerian population and the numbers of plane crash in the military, we are not saying uh, we should encourage plane crashes. But I'm saying the Nigerian Air Force is not doing bad compared to other parts of the world. It's a function of the activity, provided they are being engaged. In the last seven years alone, the Buhari administration has bought about 40 aircraft for the Air Force. And these 40 aircraft are all active, excluding what is there before. For the first time, you have a huge percentage of the Air Force aircraft being serviceable, being engaged across six parts of, you know, six regions of this country. So, um, if there are activity, there will be crisis, there will be incident, there will be accident. The good thing is that the current Air Force of today have been humble enough, they are working with the civil aviation, you can verify from the DG of NCAA, even the last plane crash that took the life of the Chief of Army Staff in Kaduna, NCAA was deeply involved. And you know that NCAA is actually advanced, I think in Africa we are on the top list in terms of accident investigation. You don't expect the military to disclose their findings because it's the military information. But I know that the information is for those who need to know in the military. So the plane crashes results, you know, the investigation, the outcome is being discussed and it's meant to improve the system. So I know that when you talk about maintenance, the Air Force is doing their best. And uh, the Air Force is well-funded compared to the Air Force of those days. And you can see a typical example of the kind of uh, platforms that are being improved on the Air Force. All right, Mr. Balami, let, let me stay with you uh, before, and I think that Mr. Balogun also will you know, want to say one or two things about this. Um, if we look at what is happening, and I totally agree with you that you know, the more activities that you, know, you have, uh, using the United States example, you know, the more that you have, the likelihood of mishaps are here and there. But then uh, we are dealing with a different type of uh, reality here. Uh, bandits are now attacking um, uh, transport infrastructure, and you saw what happened uh, in Kaduna with the train that was attacked. What people are basically saying is that uh, maybe the only 
um, the safest way to fly to get into Kaduna will be uh, through air. And therefore, that puts a burden uh, on the authorities to uh, ensure that, you know, the sort of a thing that we witnessed with the uh, train attack does not happen, uh, you know, as far as aviation is concerned. What will be your advice to the authorities on the one hand and to uh, passengers that are panicking uh, because you really cannot predict what might happen, uh, particularly in Kaduna, given what uh, uh, many of the uh, suspected bandits have said that they are trying to deal with uh, uh, the governor of the state, uh, Malam Erufai, uh, because of the manner in which he's been speaking uh, against their conduct. How, how, how do you think that people should, those who will, be, who will be resorting to flying now to Kaduna and to other parts in the country, what should be, how should they guard themselves and what should the authorities be concerned about at this point in time? You see, uh, thank you very much, Steve, for this question. The same way we have a seasoned foreign safety officer in the Air Force, uh, Air Marshal Amao, uh, we have Senator Hadi Surika, who is a pilot and also an aircraft engineer, uh, leading the affairs of aviation. But let me also shock you that the DG of the Civil Aviation is a seasoned aviator who I had the privilege to work with personally, Captain Musa Nuhu. This is somebody who represented Nigeria at the apex of aviation in Aikau in Canada. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, the level of safety we have been able to record in the civil aviation has never been this good. In the last seven years, there's no any fatal plane crash in our commercial scheduled operation. And this is because in the last seven years, uh, I think the government has put attention and ensure that the NCAA have their full autonomy in areas of taking decision, whether you know the minister, if you talk to the minister, the minister will refer you back to the DG. As far as safety is concerned, you've heard a lot of VIPs aircraft being grounded, you've heard, you can imagine the DG of NCAA from Kano, some time ago he had issues with Asman, the owner of Asman is from Kano, and he grounded Asman Airline. And today, Asman is doing very well because of that audit. And other airlines have improved based on the errors that Asman had, you know, then. Today, the civil aviation that we operate, you know, is a system where the NCAA, they don't just go there to begin to harass people. They work with the operators. Let me tell you this. The continuing airwardness of any aircraft is the responsibility of the operator. The NCAA only provides safety oversight. They go on spot inspection on a daily basis. Just yesterday in one of our hangars in Lagos where we are carrying out sea check for Dana aircraft, NCA was there. Why are they there? They want to check what are you doing in accordance with the manufacturer's manual. If you are flying, they can stop any captain from having, you know, trying to start his engine. Let me see your license. What is happening? They deal also with the air traffic controllers. They deal also with the Federal Airport Authority. So in the last seven years, I think I'm very, very happy. You know, you know, being around for about 15 years, I can say clearly that today, unlike in those days where people will call me, Balami, which ticket should I buy? Which airline should I fly? Today, when anybody calls me, I said, buy any ticket. Because all the airlines are safe today. Because the NCAA we have today, they are making sure that the continuing airworthiness is strictly adhered to. And I want to assure all passengers that we will keep doing our best from the technical point of view, from the operational point of view. And I know that the regulators are also doing their best to ensure that the airspace is safe. And that is the reason why for seven years there's no any plane crash in our commercial airline. All right, th okay. thank you. But uh, uh, Mr. Balogun, I would like you to address the same question, but also to now dimension it, you know, slightly uh, bigger. Uh, it isn't about, for, 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 for passengers, it isn't about which airline should I fly now. It's about should I fly to a particular location in Nigeria because of what is happening. Uh, you have a, a, a serious experience in Liberia in those days, and you know, of course, that aviation airports, etc., were targets at some point. Um, again, I ask, how should Nigerian passengers feel now that roads 
uh, are endangered. And then uh, 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 trains are also targets of bandits and, and, and terrorists. Should it be a concern that where do I fly to? Can I fly to, to Kaduna? Can I fly out of Kaduna? Uh, what should be my level of concern at this point? <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think there's need for the Air Force to really go out and educate the populace the more. Because uh, when we are knowledgeable about the service, then there are some questions we won't bother ourselves with. Because uh, the aircraft that crashed, it's a uh, super mishak from Pakistan, a trainer aircraft. So the trainer aircraft is for training. It has nothing to do with uh, the security of the nation. Yes, it's used to train pilots, but then for today, what we are doing is in the hands of the fighter pilots, the combat pilots, the operational pilots. So securing the nation's airspace and airport is the job of the operational pilot and with operational aircraft, not with the training aircraft. So this aircraft that has crashed, uh, will not affect the operational readiness of the Air Force. So I can assure air travelers that whatever they've been enjoying in the past will still continue because the Air Force is still capable of doing that. Now, like I said, in those days, you hardly hear anything about the Air Force. All the military, we are kept in secrecy. It's recently that, uh, yes, maybe democracy, that the military is trying to open up so that everybody will be aware what we do. Uh, accidents do happen while we are there, but you guys never get to know. You never get to hear. And I said earlier, there are three major causes of accident. It's either the man, the machine, or act of God. I'll give you an example of an act of God. We were traveling in Yola, and we were rolling to take off, and two vultures crossed the wrong way enter each of the engines, and the engine stalled. Can we take off? No. Did we have any premonition that a vulture will cross the wrong way? No. So what do we do? It was an emergency. We must try to stop the aircraft. And we tried to stop the aircraft on the wrong way. The aircraft did not stop. We applied the emergency brake, and the aircraft veered off the wrong way. And we were heading straight to a transformer. As luck will have it, there was rainfall the night before, and the place was soft. So we got stuck in a quick stand, about 10 meters away from the transformer. That was the day everybody knew I was a sprinter, because we had to you know, take to our heels. Now, we came out of that. I'm not sure anybody knew about such incident, except Air Force officers and people close by. We don't say our stories. so. People really don't know. It is now that, yes, let us do it. Let everybody see. So this administration particularly has been open. And it is good because, like uh, Mr. Balami said, we now work with the civil. The Air Force is no longer in secrecy. Whatever is happening, the whole world will know. And that's why we are here. Because in those days, nobody will be here talking about this. As it is, you may not even hear. But then, we thank God, it is opening up and everybody is know. I also heard recently that the Air Force is trying to put up a documentary which will show a typical life in the life of military men, not just Air Force men, so that Nigerians will know what these guys go through. The emotional trauma, the psychological trauma that they pass through, and uh, what they go through while performing their duties of uh, securing Nigeria. I went through it, like you said, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. I can tell you, it's not as easy as people look at us outside and say, OK, it's just a soldier. No. We put in more than our physical self. We put in emotional, psychological, and everything we've got into being alive and serving our nation. So when you hear those guys had an accident, don't just blame them that it's their fault. You need to investigate. Yes, we must investigate to prevent future occurrence. But we are prone to jump into conclusion. Is the aircraft that is not serviceable? It is this, it is that. No, I will wish 
that, like Mr. Balami said, let's wait for the outcome of the investigation. The Air Force does not operate alone any longer, so it is an open thing. And I can assure you that that crash, which has, I trained in the U.S., I started my training in uh, Nigeria, we had crashes. I went to the U.S., there were crashes. I did my instructor course in India, there were crashes. So where is it safe that... Uh, you say there will be no crashes, especially with military planes who we'll go through a lot of dangerous maneuvers to do their work. It's not straight and level like the civil takeoff, cruise and go and land. No, we do a lot of things and anything could happen. We prepare for death every day. A combat pilot, we say his last prayer once is going up, but when he comes back and landed, he thank God. But that's the nature of our job and we have to appreciate the guys that do the job. All right, Mr. Balogun, we're going to stay with you um, a little bit more on this next question. Of course, you did talk, you, you spoke about uh, sensitization of the Nigerian public, which will, of course, be very useful for everyone to understand more of the intricacies of the force. Now, of course, the Nigerian Air Force has recorded its own successes. A very good example would possibly be um, its support during the ECOMOG operations in Liberia and Syria alone, however long ago. But even with this particular example, there were some issues which were particularly tied to a delayed uh, deployment. Let's talk about speedy responses here. What is the status quo in terms of Nigerians trusting that there is going to be a quick deplo deployment when necessary? <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, based on my experience in the past, uh, I think we need to really change our approach, change our strategy, and change our tactics. Because uh, for me, we've been doing the same thing all over since this crisis started. And we've been doing the same thing. They come in, we repel them. It's like you are trying to kill a mosquito, you blow it away, you didn't kill it, it will definitely come back. So I wish we could develop that muzzle, go for the mosquitoes, kill them, and continuously pursue them until they lose the will to fight. It is not beyond us. We only need to sit down, bring our resources together, and work as a team. That's what we did in Liberia and Sierra Leone. In Liberia and Sierra Leone, there was no army, there was no navy, there was no air force. We were the armed forces of Nigeria under the ECOMOC. And that's what I, want, I would like to hear. I don't want to hear the Army did this, the Air Force did this. We didn't do it that way. And we succeeded despite all the challenges of being far away from home, despite the challenges of being under sanction at that time that even spears were not coming. Platforms were very few. Technology was almost zero. We were flying raw. Now, is digital, then was analog. But then, sheer doggedness and hard work, we succeeded. For me, I want to see the armed forces come back as a team and go and face whoever. Bandit, terrorists, they are not beyond us. They are human beings. They don't have what we have. So we can succeed and uh, we only need to sit down together and forge ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Bal uh, Balogu. Uh, Mr. Balami, uh, uh, well, I mean, we're gradually running out of time, but this is something that I would like you to, you know, sp speak about. Uh, the governor of Kaduna State, uh, Malame Rufai, says, uh, I mean, he's been consistent about it, you know, bomb out uh, the terrorist. If you know the location as you claim, what are you waiting for? Uh, which may... Uh, go along with the thoughts that uh, Mr. Balogo has just expressed in terms of we can, you know, root out these people. But then we had only uh, a couple of days ago uh, the National Security Advisor, you know, saying that that's now how it works. You know, it has to uh, 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 work through intelligence. You can't just go a bombing. Uh, what would be your thought, given somebody that is knowledgeable in that sector? And I'm speaking security now, not necessarily aviation, uh, between what the governor of Kaduna State is saying, which is reflective of what the people are expressing and then what the uh, NSA has said as to how to better engage uh, in dealing with these bandits and terrorists. What would be your thoughts? please? Yeah, you see, uh, 
The governor of Kaduna State, uh, Malam Nasiru El Rufai, and the NSA, you see, they are both right. And because they are all speaking from, you know, uh, their experiences and what they feel should be done. Uh, from the side of the governor, you will see clearly that um, he is not happy that his people are dying. He's not happy that Nigerians are dying. And he wants action to be taken. But you see, the NSA, you know, sees this whole situation from with a different lens. He's looking at what would be the collateral damage if the bandits are in a particular village where you have 100,000 people settling in that village and you bomb that whole village because of uh, 20 bandits. Is that fair? There are so many factors that, you know, the military will consider uh, because Amnesty International is there, human rights are there. Uh, and uh, there's a high level of intelligence, you know, and um, uh, strategy that needs to be put in, you know, to look into those issues. And uh, unfortunately for our armed forces, you know, I really, really feel for them. Because when you say, uh, when you go to Lagos and you see the downfall drivers or the taxi drivers giving free rights to military men, or you see the government celebrating our fallen heroes every year, Armed Forces Remembrance Day. It's for one reason as far as I'm actually concerned. Today, if a pilot is taking off from Abuja to Lagos, and uh, the weather is not good, NCA will say, close the airspace. For military, it is not like that. If the weather is bad, if there are any issues, and there's a mission that needs to you know, be attended to, just like our general here did say, the fighter pilot, you know, the armed forces will not say, let me wait for weather. They will take that risk. And that is why we see our fallen heroes. For me, I think as a country, you know, instead of even treating the symptoms, we should go back to the fundamentals. You know, we need to look at educating our youth, educating our children, you know, because if the youths are not, are not educated, they will always be used as bandits, as terrorists, as Boko Harams. So the government needs to look more into educational sector. We need to put attention into parenting. Our spiritual leaders, imams and pastors and traditional rulers need to wake up because the values are being lost. The Nigerians, I know as a young person as I am today, it's not what is happening today. You see things happening today across the whole world, most especially even here in Nigeria. We've lost our value system, and that is why a 15, 20 years old boy or girl can be engaged in crime with impunity. So as a nation, we need to revisit our national culture. You know, what, is, what are our values? What is happening to us? How can, you know, so, so we need to look at all that, please. All right. We want to thank you, Mr. Isaac Balami, Mr. Abayami Balogun, joining us from our Abuja studios to discuss some very pertinent issues facing the Nigerian Air Force.